Good evening. What you're about to witness is an unrehearsed, uncensored interview on the issue of birth control. It will be a free discussion of an adult topic, a topic that we feel merits public examination. My name is Mike Wallace. The cigarette is Philip Morris. New Philip Morris, probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted, presents... Mike Wallace interview. Tonight we go after the story of the woman who violated convention and bucked powerful opposition to lead the birth control movement in America. You see her behind me, she is Mrs. Margaret Sanger, who was thrown into jail eight different times for her efforts. If you're curious to know why Mrs. Sanger has devoted her life to the birth control movement, if you'd like to hear her answer to the charge that birth control is a sin, and if you want to get her views on politics, divorce, and God, we'll go after those stories in just a moment. My guests' opinions are not necessarily mine. The stations are my sponsors, Philip Morris Incorporated, but whether you agree or disagree, we feel that none should deny the right of these views to be broadcast. One might say that the basis of this program is fact and fiction. And using that yardstick, I'd like to apply it to something I usually talk about at this time, and that is this. Philip Morris cigarettes. Here's why I smoke them and enjoy them. Fact one. Today's Philip Morris is no ordinary blend. It's a special blend of domestic and imported tobaccos. Opinion? My taste may be different from yours, but on this I think we can agree. This cigarette tastes natural. I think you'll like it. Fact two. Today's Philip Morris is made of mild, lighter leaf tobaccos. Opinion? To me, that accounts for the genuine mildness I get in every puff. It's what I call a man's kind of mildness. There's no filter, no fooling, no artificial mildness because, you see, there's nothing between you and the tobacco itself. And fact three is, of course, this box. Philip Morris was the first non-filter cigarette to come in a crush-proof box. Opinion? A cigarette that keeps better, smokes better. So get with Philip Morris yourself and check these facts. And when you do, I think you'll find it's probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted. And now to our story. When Mrs. Margaret Sanger opened the first birth control clinic in the United States back in 1916, birth control was a dirty word. The police threw her into jail as they were to do seven more times during her crusade a crusade that still faces the reasoning but unalterable opposition of the Roman Catholic Church. That crusade kept Mrs. Sanger away from her children for long periods. It helped to break up her first marriage, and she suffered constant, harrowing social abuse. Mrs. Sanger, in view of all of that, let me ask you this first of all. Why did you do it? I realize that you had an intellectual conviction that birth control was a boon to mankind, but I'm sure that others have that conviction too. And so what I'd like to know is this. What events, what emotions in your life made Margaret Sanger a crusader for birth control? Well, Mr. Wallace, it's hard to say that any one thing has made one do this or that. I think from the very beginning, uh, I came with a large family, my mother died young, 11 children, that made an impression on me as a child. Mm -hmm. I was a trained nurse, went among the people. I saw women who asked to have some means whereby they wouldn't have to have another pregnancy too early after the last child, the last abortion, which many of them had. So there's a number of things that are one after the other that really made you feel that you had to do something. There are some other possible reasons that suggest themselves on reading your, bio your biography by Lawrence later. Your mother, as you say, died prematurely after bearing 11 children. She was born a Catholic, was she not? She was born a Catholic, yes. And your, In Ireland. your father was a sort of a village atheist who clashed with church authorities. And because of his atheism, his earnings dwindled under community pressure. You and your brothers and sisters were known as, quote, children of the devil, end quote. Could it be then, that in part at least, you were driven emotionally toward the birth control movement because of antagonism toward the church, because that was a way to fight the church? 
No, I don't think I had anything of the kind in mind. I was, uh, I was what I would call a born humanitarian. I don't like to see people suffer. I don't like to see cruelty, even to this day. And in nursing, you see a great deal of cruelty and unnecessary suffering. At that time, there was no opposition as far as the church was concerned, any church. It was mainly the law, mm -hmm. the federal law and state laws that one had to, uh, to think of. The church was not in my mind at all. Well, in going after your motive then, and I will press you just a little bit more about that and then get to the specifics of this evening, but in your motive, in the movement, is it possible that the movement itself, the feeling of wanting to do anything that you felt was important, that perhaps that moved you a good deal? Because the fact remains that you led a movement against overwhelming pressures that stemmed back for centuries, and in doing so, according to your autobiography, you even left your first husband. And you wrote this to a friend, Mrs. Sanger. You said, where is the man to give me what the movement gives in joy and interest and freedom. Now, what was this joy, this freedom that you craved? Well, I don't remember that letter, who it was written, but I think that it was not uh, a question of, uh, uh, of marriage at all. There was a, a certain satisfaction in uh, doing something that was going to alleviate the sufferings of women in particular, and I was quite a feminist at the time, mm -hmm, obviously. and uh, yes, and uh, uh, I naturally didn't want to see women take all the suffering of childbearing and of pregnancies. So it was a pleasure in a sense to think that you were striking uh, at an archaic law, which it was, mm -hmm. it was put on the statute books by Anthony Comstock some years ago, and uh, no one had stood up against it, no one had, had uh, tried to, uh, uh, to change the laws. And at that time, not even a doctor had a right to use the United States mails and common carriers for books, for learning, for anything that he had to do with this question. It was considered obscene. The whole question was obs considered obscene. Mrs. Sanger, you have helped to spread the birth control movement not only here in the United States, but in Europe and the Orient as well. Why? Why is birth control of such vital importance internationally? Is it just to save women suffering? Is that the only reason in your mind? Well, not entirely. The population question is a great concern today. And the, the rate at which uh, the birth, births come in to the, we're saving them now. At one time, when children died, they didn't have the food. Mm -hmm. uh, today, our population all over the world is getting certainly better consideration and better conditions than they had at the time that I was there. I went to every country because I was invited. And uh, I didn't spread, go into the country myself. I was invited to go to Japan and uh, uh, to speak there, to have eight lectures on the question of birth control and peace. Well, do you believe that birth control is essential if we want to keep millions of people across the world from starving? Is that your thesis? Say it again. Do you feel that birth control is essential to keep millions of people across the world from starving? Well, I think the birth control, if you keep your population uh, more or less static until you pick up your resources, certainly you'll keep them and prevent their starving. Well, what's more important, birth control or picking up the resources? Well, picking up the resources, is, uh, there's just a limit to that, too. There's just so much to take Japan. And she cannot feed. They've had the best experts come there when MacArthur was there. Mm -hmm. and the best experts have said they have 20 million more people and they can feed. She's got to be fed outside in some, in some way. Mm -hmm. She's got to have that kind of help if she's going to keep from, from fighting. From but certainly around the world there is, uh, there is potential agricultural land that is not being properly used now. Just this past year, on May 21st, the New York Times summarized an important study of the world's food resources made by Professor James Bonner of the California Institute of Technology. Professor Bonner says the world is not using one billion acres of potential agricultural land, and he adds that if this land were used and present agricultural land were improved, the entire world could be fed adequately, even if the population increased by one-third in the next 50 years. Oh, Mr. Wallace, you hear so many fantastic things of what can happen, what may happen. Uh, this and that, I've heard it for the last 30 years, at any rate, of what could be done, but it's never done. Uh, 
And the thing is, what is it now? What have we got today? A very distinguished woman spoke to me about Arizona. And she said, I wish you wouldn't talk about population. She said, all the population of the United States can be put in one state. And I said, what state? She said, Arizona. I said, did you ever hear of Caliche? She didn't know that I was talking about a delicatessen or, or what. I said, well, Caliche is harder than any rock. And it is about three inches below the ground where it looks beautiful. It looks as if you could have food. It looks as if you could have corn or wheat or cotton. But as a matter of fact, you have to dynamite Caliche out of the ground in, in order to well, have a little shrub, have you know, <laughs> a little grass mm -hmm. or a few flowers. So many problems that, uh, when it comes to that. And the demographers, I never heard of anyone that would agree with that, that we could have another uh, in the world. Another third. Another third. Another third. Well, you say that originally the opposition was in all law, and you have to fight against that. Today, your opposition stems mainly from where? From what source? Well, I think that the opposition uh, is mainly from the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Of the Church. Well, now hierarchy. Of the hierarchy of the Church. You feel that the, the parishioners themselves, the lay people in the Church, are not against birth control. I feel they come to all of our clinics just the same as their non-Catholics do. Exactly the same. Well, let's look at the official Catholic position opposition to birth control. I read now from a church publication called The Question Box. In forbidding birth control, it says the following. It says, the immediate purpose and primary end of marriage is the begetting of children. When the marital relation is so used as to render the fulfillment of its purposes impossible, that is by birth control, it is used unethically and unnaturally. Now, what's wrong with that position? Well, it's very wrong. It's not normal. It's not, uh, it, it has the wrong attitude toward marriage, toward love, toward the relationships between men and women. Well, the natural law, they say, is that first of all, the primary function of sex in marriage is to beget children. Well, Don't, do you disagree with that? I disagree with that 100%. Your feeling is what then? My feeling is that love and the attraction between men and women, in many cases, the very finest relationship, has nothing to do with bearing a child. It's secondary. Many, many times we know that. You see your birth rate, you talk to people who have very happy marriages and they're not having babies every year. Yes, I think that's a celibate attitude. Surely. Well, a celibate attitude, but you agree that Catholicism, according to the tenets of Catholicism, they rule that birth control violates not only the church's position, it isn't the church's position, but they say that it violates a natural law, as I have just explained. Therefore, birth control is a sin, no matter who practices it. Now, the violation of the natural law, according, you certainly can take no issue with the natural law as the hierarchy of the uh, Catholic Church regards it. Well, I certainly do take issue with it. I think it's untrue, and I think it's unnatural. Well, let me ask you... I think bears it out that it's an unnatural attitude to take, and how do they know? I mean, after all, they're celibates. They don't know love. They don't know marriage. They know nothing about bringing up children or any of the marriage problems of life. And yet they speak to people as if they were God. Let me, let me ask you this question. Suppose a healthy, a well-to-do couple decide for some reason never to have children, use birth control all their lives. Would you say that your methods are being misused, Mrs. Sanger? Not if they were intelligent people and they had some reason for thinking of children as a responsibility or the, some disease that they might have that they wouldn't like to pass on to a child. And I think it would be a very uh, unselfish attitude for them to take if there is a disease. No, I say a healthy, well-to-do couple. A couple that just doesn't want children, and for that reason they use birth control all the way. Well, Do you think that that is a, is a misuse of your methods? I don't think it's a misuse. I think it's, if, if they're intelligent adults, but they must know what they want. They must manage their lives themselves. And certainly there's nothing in birth control than there is in other things that you might deny yourself. I asked you your motives a little while ago at the beginning of the program, your motives in working for birth control as hard as you have for as many years as you have. You reject the principal Catholic argument against birth control as being totally invalid. What do you think is the reason, the motive of the church in forbidding birth control? You'd have to ask a Catholic that. I couldn't take their motive is. 
Well, I, you, you couldn't say officially what their motive is, but you certainly must have an opinion about it, Mrs. Sanger. Well, I'm, I, I don't have much to do with, with uh, the hierarchy. Well, and I know that the people that come to our organization and want to have the same methods, or whatever it is that one can have, to prevent a pregnancy, that those women will say to us, I, we ask their religion very often, and they say, I am a Catholic, I've been raised in the Catholic Church, and this, my church is wrong on this. This is the one thing. I will never be anything else, but my church is wrong on this one thing. And that is said over and over and over again. So what the motive is? Well, you won't hazard a guess. I don't care to. Thank you. Uh, may I ask you why? Now, I know that in private, and uh, in actually in public discussions, I think, prior to this time, you have been willing to state your understanding of what the motives of the church are, and now you would, uh, you would rather remain silent. May I ask you why? Well, simply because I don't think that uh, uh, the church has changed in its attitude. Some of the hierarchy have changed their attitude. You can't say the same thing that you might have said a year ago or two years ago, as to your belief or as to your opinion. Mm -hmm. and, and then church... Have you heard it said that the reason that the church is against birth control is because they want more Catholics? I've read it. Do you believe it? Well, they, they, if you read their papers, where they t uh, point out Boston, that that's what has happened in Boston and Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. They have simply outbred the Protestants, and they're, they've, in Boston and Massachusetts, they have control. I've read that in their own papers. Of Mass course, the church's answer, the church's answer, and I read now from a pamphlet published by the Redemptist, uh, Redemptorist Fathers in Missouri, says as follows. It says that point of view about wanting more Catholics is nonsense. Quote, the Catholic Church does not command Catholic husbands and wives to have even one child. The Church considers it more than normally meritorious for them to have no children if they mutually and perpetually give up the use of the marriage right for the love of God. All right. All I right. don't quote what they, what they do, so they, I think that the question in my mind is that they, they do and uh, order their own people to do as they wish. But I object to their uh, having the same rules for people who are not of the same religion. Well, they believe, you see, that it is a natural law, not a Catholic law, but a natural law, and therefore a sin not just for Catholics, but a sin for all peoples. And I think that there are other religious groups that very, very orthodox Jews feel the same way about birth control. Uh, let's look at another argument against birth control, Mrs. Sanger, published in Red Book magazine in March of 1956. It says birth control is a devastating social force which tends to weaken the moral fiber of the community. Immunity from parenthood encourages promiscuity, particularly when unmarried persons can so easily avail themselves of the devices. Do you doubt that? I doubt it. You do? Certainly. Then let me read from a news story in the Philadelphia Daily News on June 10th, 1942. The story quotes you as urging the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps to give its members, quote, preventive measures against pregnancy, end quote. And you add, quote, abortion and illegitimacy are bound to result if the government doesn't recognize human nature, end quote. In other words, you were not advocating uh, Christian morality, but rather ways for single women to avoid bearing illegitimate children. Where was this taken from? Philadelphia Daily News, June 10, 1942, direct quote from Margaret Sanger. I doubt it. I don't believe I ever made such a remark. Well, in the same vein, in your autobiography, which you cannot disavow, you wrote the following about sexologist Havelock Ellis. You said he's been able to clarify the question of sex and free it from the smudginess connected with it from the beginning of Christianity. Now, why, what do you mean by the smudginess connected with sex, and why do you blame it on Christianity? Well, there's many reasons, of course, to say that we have more records of it than the dawn of Christianity. And I think I was speaking of Havelock Ellis as having clarified the question of homosexuals, making the thing uh, not exactly a perverted thing, but a thing that a person is born with, different kinds of eyes, different kinds of, of structure, and so forth. But he didn't make all homosexuals uh, perverts. I felt that he helped clarify that to the medical profession and to the scientists of the world, as perhaps one of the first ones to, did, to do that. That was one of the things that I meant in that. 
Mr. Sanger, do you uh, disagree that Catholics, or do you, do you feel that Catholics should not have a right to have a say when a city administration contemplates spending their tax dollars on birth control or the dissemination of birth control information, something that Catholics believe is sinful? That they have a right to say what they... Do you feel that they don't have a right to have a say when a city administration contemplates spending their dollars, tax dollars, on birth control? For instance, here in New York, Catholics comprise about 45% of our population. They're the largest single group. Well, don't you think they should have the democratic right to lobby against having their money spent, their tax money spent, for something that they consider evil? Well, I suppose they have a right. They certainly do it. But so have the others. They're only 45% of the population. That's that is not the, the majority. But they have a right to get up and... Certainly. Mm -hmm. I'd have no objection to their having them say that, but I think we could have the same right. I say we, I mean non-Catholics. Well, of course, this is a little bit at variance with something that you told our reporter earlier this week. You said earlier this week, it's not only wrong, it should be made illegal for any religious group to prohibit dissemination of birth control, even among its own members. In other words, you would like to see the government legislate uh, religious beliefs in a certain sense. Where these strange things come to, uh, that I said them is what I should like to know when. Well now, uh, you know that my reporter spent a good deal of time with you. He's a very accurate young man. Yes. Well, and this, so is a, this is a, this is a <laughs> specific quote. Well, I don't think I could say it quite that way. What are your religious beliefs, Mrs. Sanger? Do you believe in a God in the sense of a divine being who rewards or punishes people after death? Well, I have a different attitude about uh, the divine. I feel that we have divinity within us. And the more we express the good part of our lives, uh, the more the divine within us uh, expresses itself. Uh, I suppose I would call myself an Episcopalian by, uh, by religion. And there's uh, many other, uh, if you've traveled around the world, you get quite a bit of the feeling of uh, all, all religions have so much alike in the divine part of our own being. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you just couldn't put that in a book or you couldn't put it into a, uh, a phrase or a sentence. Do you believe in sin? When I say believe, I don't mean in believe in committing sin. Do you believe there is such a thing as, a, as sin? Well, I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have m disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being, practically, delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just mark when they're born. That to me is the greatest sin that people can, can commit. But sin in the ordinary sense that we regard it, do you believe or do you not believe? Well, what? What would they be? Do you believe that infidelity is a sin? Well, I don't, I'm not going to specify what I think is sin. I've stated what I think is the worst sin. The yes, sin. but then you asked me to say what, and I, and I said what, and, and, and uh, you refused to answer me? Ah, yes, I don't know about infidelity. It has so many personalities to it and what a person's own belief is. You can't, I couldn't generalize on any of those things as, as being sin. Murder is a sin. Well, I naturally think murder is a, well, it's a sin or not. It's a terrible act. In just a moment, Mrs. Sanger, I'd like to ask you about another social problem here in the United States, divorce. Nearly 400,000 couples get divorced in this country each year. And I'd like to get your views on the cause and possible prevention of this problem. And we'll get Mrs. Sanger's answer to that question in just 60 seconds. One look at this cabin cruiser, and you'd know it's new. One puff of this cigarette, and you know it's new. It's Philip Morris, and you know by the taste. Philip Morris tastes natural, and that's why smokers like it. And they like the man's kind of mildness in Philip Morris. No filter, no fooling. Nothing artificial between you and the tobacco itself. And the box, here's something else smokers like. It's practical, crush-proof. If you haven't smoked a Philip Morris lately, get with it. You'll find a natural taste, a man's kind of mildness, a crush-proof box. Get with Philip Morris, probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted. Get with Philip Morris in regular pack or crush-proof box, probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted.
Now then, Mrs. Sanger, there are nearly 400,000 divorces or annulments in America each year. What, and this is hard to do in the short time, of course, that we have, what would you recommend to cut down our divorce rate? Well, as a, a great many box clinics are including in the work you know, that they do in birth control clinics, having marriage counseling. So when the woman or the man come and complain of their marriage on the skids, mm -hmm. we invite them to come and have special talks with some of our psychiatrists or others who are making a study of that all over the country, mm -hmm. where we have about 500 clinics. They almost all include uh, marriage counseling and marriage erection. May I, may I ask you this? Could it be that women in the United States have become too independent, that they've followed the lead of women like Margaret Sanger, by neglecting family life for a career. Let me quote from your biography describing your second marriage to Noah Slee. Quote, in New York, Mrs. Sanger maintained every clause of their compact of independence. They had separate apartments. They telephoned each other for dinner or theater engagements or passed notes back and forth. Would you call this a sound formula for marriage, Mrs. Sanger? Uh, different people, yes. It certainly was for me and for my husband. We had a very happy marriage consulting. He had different friends than I had. And uh, I don't believe in forcing. Uh, after all, we were two adults. Mm -hmm. And uh, forcing your friends on uh, another person who may have an entirely different outlook. It worked out very well. I know that it did. You have two sons. One final question. You have two sons. Mm -hmm. How many children have they? Would you like to see them? I would indeed. <laughs> As well. As <laughs> How many children? Uh, six in this family? Five boys and a girl in that family. And in the other family? Two girls. Two girls. Miss mm -hmm. Sanger, I thank you so much for taking time out and coming and talking to us here this evening. And Mr. Wells, I've never smoked, but I'm going to begin to take up smoking and, and use Philip Morris as my, as, as my the cigarette for me to take. <laughs> well, I thank you very much, Mrs. Sanger. Indeed. In the eyes of some, Margaret Sanger has been a heroine. In the eyes of others, she's been a destructive force. The purpose of this interview has been not, of course, to try to resolve this issue, but to open it to a little sensible discussion. This was done with the feeling that all of us, regardless of our beliefs, can do nothing but profit from a free exchange of ideas. I'll bring you a rundown on next week's interview in just a sec 60 seconds or so. These few seconds at the end of the interview, or among the most enjoyable of the week for me, for much as I enjoy smoking during the interview, Mrs. Sanger, I believe I enjoy this cigarette most right now. Of course, Philip Morris is easy to enjoy. The taste is natural. There's mildness here, too. Today's Philip Morris has what I call a man's kind of mildness. There's no filter, no fooling, no artificial mildness, because there is nothing between you and the tobacco itself. Which is why I say, get with Philip Morris. Probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted. Next week, by popular demand, we're going after more of the opinions, gripes, and philosophy of Frank Lloyd Wright, the revolutionary architect who attacked what he called the mobocracy on this program three weeks ago. This time, we'll find out, among other things, why Mr. Wright says that he has a great affection for the people of the Soviet Union, and we'll get his views at the age of 88 on death and immortality. That's next Saturday night. Till then, for Philip Morris, Mike Wallace, good night. The Mike Wallace interview is brought to you by Philip Morris Incorporated, the quality house. Kings of the Ten Pins meet in match game competition. Watch Bowling Stars every Sunday night on ABC Television Network.